Good afternoon, and thank you everyone so much for being here. My name is Julie Watkins, and I will be hosting today's travelog brought to you by the Geographic Society of Chicago. Since 1898, the Geographic Society of Chicago has educated the public about geography and its important uses. Today's GSC trains students in the latest geospatial technology. Through services such as our community mapping projects, we offer unique educational experiences that harness the power of maps and the integrative tools of GIS or geographic information systems to solve environmental and community issues. Together, our board and membership provide educational opportunities for students and educators, assist in building geographic materials collections in educational and cultural institutions, promote new and emerging technologies and problem solving and much more. With us to present today is Chris Piper. Chris is a master's student at the School of Area and Global Studies at Oxford University. His research interests include contemporary Chinese culture, politics and society, China-US relations, and theories of state power and governance. Prior to joining this program, Chris lived and worked in Shenzhen and Hong Kong from 2018 to 2020. Today, he's excited to take you on a tour of Hong Kong, where he will share some of his stories, insights, and experiences gathered uh, from 11 months of living there. Specifically, he will discuss Hong Kong in the context of its recent and ongoing political developments that are dramatically transforming the city. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, let me just start by saying that it's an uh, honor to be here presenting with everyone. Um, I've watched a few of these travelogue series and um, they've all been really, really fascinating. Uh, and so I'm just thrilled to be here um, and uh, to share some of my thoughts uh, and experiences about Hong Kong. Um, so just a little bit more about why I was living in Hong Kong. This was from uh, basically uh, almost all of 2020, from uh, February to, um, to December of 2020. And um, it was uh, originally um, due to remote work arrangements uh, related to COVID-19. Um, I was originally based in Shenzhen, which is uh, right uh, outside, uh, right next to the border of Hong Kong. Uh, but due to COVID-related um, uh, uh, issues, I was based in uh, Hong Kong. And then um, a few months uh, after that, the borders between Hong Kong and Shenzhen were kind of indefinitely closed, um, which is why I ended up living in Hong Kong, kind of through this sort of uh, serendipitous accident uh, for almost the whole year. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it was a, actually a, a really um, interesting uh, time to be there. And it was uh, an experience that, you know, um, in hindsight was was really rewarding and fulfilling for me um, and I hope to share with you some of the uh, the experiences that I had um, in this travelogue today um, and I also just want to start off by saying that um, I am not an expert or uh, you know fully qualified uh, academic in all of these issues nor am I uh, somebody who grew up and is um, as intimately familiar with the city as perhaps uh, local uh, residents are um, so I don't mean to uh, impose any of uh, these sort of expert views but instead just want to share some of my experiences as someone maybe who is visiting or who is kind of an outsider looking in um, and share some of the things that I found uh, surprising and new and interesting um, about the city. Um, so this will be great if you're just interested in learning more about Hong Kong, interested in contextualizing some of the news developments related to Hong Kong that you might have been reading about uh, recently, um, or if you even want to travel there sometime uh, in the future, hopefully this will give you some insights and tips uh, for, for planning that trip. So uh, just what we'll go over today is just a little bit of the background of Hong Kong, the history, the geography uh, of, the, of the territory. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about getting around and sort of the logistics of how to go around the city. And then I'll take you on a sort of uh, tour around the territory. We'll hit up the four main uh, districts and areas of the city, and I'll just go over some of the local highlights, um, so, uh, like places to go uh, sightseeing and some of the interesting points of interest. Um, and through, uh, through this tour as well, I will also point out some of the features of the 2019 and 2020 protest movement um, that really sort of uh, began this transformation of the city that, that we see today. Um, finally, I'll just end with some more cultural points such as food, nightlife, arts and culture, um, and then a short kind of uh, like um, summary of the political developments and implications um, that, uh, that, these, um, that are sort of ongoing right now. Um, so just a little bit about the geography of Hong Kong. Uh, you can see here, Hong Kong is located in southern China in the Guangdong province. Um, zooming in a little bit, this is Hong Kong in the context of the region, it's, which is um, sort of known as the Greater Bay Area, um, which is all in uh, Guangdong province of mainland China. 
Um, so uh, Hong Kong is here in red um, in this sort of like peninsula on the edge of Guangdong. And right next to it um, is, the town of the, is the city of Shenzhen, um, which is a relatively new city that really grew rapidly uh, along with China's economic growth in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, up the Pearl River Delta, which is this um, peninsula of water here, um, uh, sorry, this, this delta over here. Uh, if you go up, you see Guangzhou, uh, which uh, when, uh, is also known as Canton uh, in, in English. Um, and uh, it's a very, another major Chinese city and manufacturing hub. And across the water are some uh, other major cities, including Macau, which was a former Portuguese uh, colony that is now um, part of uh, China and is uh, uh, known for sort of tourism and gambling um, and casinos and that sort of thing. Um, uh, the political status of Hong Kong is a little bit complicated. It's technically uh, a part of China, uh, of the People's Republic of China, but it has a sort of hard border and its own separate governing structure and governing system um, in a system that's known as one country, two systems. So basically, uh, they acknowledge that it's all one country, it's all China, but there's two systems of governance and, um, and politics that, um, uh, that operate. Um, uh, oh, and I also just want to mention the context of the Greater Bay Area because um, it's increasingly, uh, it's playing an increasingly important role in sort of shaping Hong Kong's future development uh, and, uh, and trajectory. Um, and so when we're talking about Hong Kong, even though we'll be zoomed in on this, you know, this territory, it's important to keep this larger context of the Greater Bay Area and of uh, mainland China in mind. Um, and so now we zoom into Hong Kong itself. And as, uh, as you can see, it uh, uh, seems like quite a large territory. It's about um, 400 square miles. Um, but the actual part of it that is uh, urban and, and uh, livable, where, where people actually live and work, um, is actually only about 15% of the land area. Um, and so as a result, it's very, very densely um, populated. And um, uh, it's um, got one of the highest population densities in the world with around um, 6,000 people per square mile. So um, very, very uh, dense. This also means that um, there's a, a very high concentration of skyscrapers, um, a very high uh, concentration of uh, large buildings, and also um, a, a screen, extremely huge and vast uh, sort of, they call it country parks, but you can sort of think of them as uh, national parks or nature reserves that we have um, in the US. <clears throat> um, here's just a couple, a little bit more uh, facts about uh, Hong Kong. Um, so the population is about 7.5 million people, and most of them are Han Chinese ethnically, but there is a sort of sizable uh, ethnic minority population of um, uh, Indians, Filipinos, as well as um, English or European expats. Um, living and working in uh, Hong Kong. Um, the primary languages are Cantonese and uh, Man Mandarin, which is the national language of mainland China, uh, but also English is uh, very widely spoken as the second language, which is a sort of legacy of the British colonial rule um, that um, uh, I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, its, econ its economy is mainly based as a international hub of trade and finance, uh, as well as tourism. And this has sort of given rise to uh, the Hong Kong government's um, like promotion of itself as so-called Asia's world city, which is a label that um, we'll revisit sort of towards the end of this presentation and reconsider in the context of some of the recent political changes. Um, its name, uh, Hong Kong in Cantonese is uh, a Xiangang in uh, Mandarin. Uh, the characters mean a fragrant harbor. So also sort of alluding to its long history of being a major port and shipping uh, trading destination um, uh, in the region. Um, it's uh, also characterized, uh, just some of the other uh, facts, is characterized by um, low taxation and um, uh, like very uh, easy business regulations and free trade, as well as strong, a strong uh, global currency, which helps to uh, burnish its reputation as this hub of trade and finance. It also has a very major uh, uh, shipping port and is the 10th largest exporter, ninth largest importer of goods and services in the world. And the climate is uh, tropical. Um, it's quite warm year round, uh, maybe in the winter around December and January, it gets a bit cooler, but um, throughout most of the year, it's quite warm. And in the summers, it can get very, very uh, hot and humid um, as well. 
All right, and uh, just a, a brief history of, of the uh, territory, um, especially in relation to um, the British rule. Uh, I just want to go over the history before we go on our journey around the city, because um, I think the historical understanding is very central to, um, to making sense of a lot of the uh, political changes and the political opinions that, um, uh, that uh, people in Hong Kong have, especially in recent years. Um, so it was, uh, it's been settled for a very, very long time. I don't know much about the ancient history, unfortunately, but um, for what I could uh, read, it was um, uh, throughout um, the history of like uh, ancient and um, uh, medieval China, like it was a, a major destination for um, immigrants and emigrants, um, partly due to this, um, this harbor status. Again, it was an easy place for people to come and go and trade and, and do business. Um, in uh, the 1800s, um, the uh, British, um, uh, due, due basically to a British need for uh, silver in order to purchase goods from China, uh, from the Qing dynasty at the time, um, uh, the British, uh, the, the Qing dynasty could only accept payment in silver. Uh, and the British, um, lacking this resource, uh, started to smuggle opium into, uh, into China in order to um, get silver payments in return. And then they would use these silver payments to buy these highly desirable Chinese goods um, like teas, porcelain, silk, um, those types of things. Um, after a while, the uh, of course, the Chinese government sort of got um, uh, fed up enough with this practice that they decided to um, burn some of the shipments of opium and really crack down on this illegal trade. And in response, the British uh, launched this opium war and um, due to their sort of naval supremacy, um, were able to defeat the Qing uh, uh, forces and eventually cede Hong Kong uh, Island um, and, and gain Hong Kong Island under their control. Um, a few years later, just um, mostly due to some uh, you know, kind of minor incidents um, that were escalated into sort of war uh, and military responses. Um, the British launched a second opium war against China, which they also won. And um, part of the uh, peninsula here, Kowloon Peninsula, was ceded to the British. Um, and finally, in uh, uh, a few years later after that, um, after the Chinese the government, uh, the Qing dynasty lost the Sino-Japanese War and were very weakened, um, a lot of different European territories started carving up different sections of the country, opening ports and um, establishing bases and that sort of thing. And the British, of course, wanted um, part of this as well. And so in 1898, um, the new territories, which is uh, the sort of land north of that boundary, but still south of uh, Shenzhen and south of mainland China, those territories were leased to the British for 99 years. And this 99 years is a bit significant, so keep that in mind, but this is just what it looks like on a map. So first it started with Hong Kong Island, this uh, small island in the darkest blue. Um, after the second opium war, Kowloon was seated, which is uh, slightly lighter blue um, and very small, this peninsula here. And then the new territories lease gave the rest of the Hong Kong territory to the British uh, by uh, 1898. <clears throat> Um, and so uh, the British uh, colonial rule, um, you know, they were uh, the occupiers and um, they established a government, established um, society there for pretty much the entirety of the 20th century, uh, except for 1941 to 1945, when Japanese forces occupied Hong Kong uh, during World War II. Um, uh, during that time, you know, of course, uh, like many places of Jap Japanese occupation, um, there was, uh, you know, severe degradation in living standards and human rights. Um, uh, there was a lot of emigration, um, just really a, a whole lot of um, serious problems. Um, but uh, shortly after the war, there was, uh, of course, the rebuilding. And then in the 1950s to 1980s, the population started to see a boom, um, especially from uh, immigrants coming from mainland China and moving to Hong Kong, um, partly due to the, um, uh, partly a lot of them were on uh, the sort of the wrong side of the Chinese Civil War. Once the communists won the Chinese Civil War, um, a lot of people um, came to uh, Hong Kong as one of the destinations. Um, for um, for for leaving uh, mainland China, 
as the population grew um, and uh, also due to the British sort of connections to uh, other destinations around the world, um, trade started to increase, manufacturing became really significant, and then uh, the living standards slowly started to improve. Um, it wasn't all as maybe rosy and, and great as maybe some uh, folks would like to uh, paint it. I mean, there was still not really democracy or um, uh, there were still restrictions on um, sort of rights and living standards. Um, but um, over this period of time, uh, uh, Hong Kong started to uh, really grow economically, especially compared to, um, to the economic developments in mainland China, which during the time were still uh, quite stagnant um, until, of course, the 1980s and 90s. Um, now, you remember uh, the new territories area was leased, technically leased to the British for only 99 years. And at the time of the lease, most British people thought that it was as good as perpetuity. Um, it basically meant forever, even though on paper it said 99 years. But, um, you know, as the 1980s come along, uh, we see that the deadline for returning Hong Kong to mainland China is starting to, um, to, to approach. And um, it would have been very, very complicated to um, return just this new territories part to China without returning the Hong Kong Island and Kowloon sections, which were um, uh, which technically could have stayed as British colonies, um, but logistically and also ethically, um, you know, it, it was just kind of a non-starter to keep those as British pro um, properties and return the rest to uh, mainland China. So during the 1980s, um, negotiations were for basically returning all of Hong Kong to, uh, to Chinese rule. Um, but they did it in a particular way that was outlined in the Sino-British Joint Declaration uh, of 1984. And the, the proposal that was outlined was a system called One Country, Two Systems, which basically um, would return Hong Kong officially on paper to um, Chinese rule, but it would allow them to sort of keep uh, their, their ways of life, keep um, uh, their unique political system, legal system, um, in even cultural, you know, certain cultural th um, things, um, keep those, um, you know, untouched uh, for a period of 50 years. So um, uh, that 50 year period, you know, every year it gets closer and closer to the expiry of uh, 2047. Um, and, uh, you know, as we can see from, from some of these recent uh, political developments, a lot of people think that the Chinese government is really trying to, um, uh, if not explicitly push that date more, you know, forward, at least trying to prepare the territory for a smoother transition and integration into mainland China um, by 2047. So, um, you know, as, as outsiders, you might see a lot of these developments as quite shocking or, um, uh, you know, uh, disheartening. But um, un unfortunately, the reality is Hong Kong is kind of living on borrowed time and uh, it is sort of destined to become a, sort of a, a integrated part of mainland China by 2047. Um, in the 2000s, this is just after Hong Kong was uh, sort of returned to mainland Chinese rule, but um, governed as a sort of uh, autonomous region. Um, there was a few uh, uh, developments. So, um, uh, and the first major ones were like in, in 2003, um, when the SARS outbreak uh, occurred, um, which basically, um, uh, it, luckily, you know, unlike this outbreak, it was contained rather quickly, but um, it gave uh, the population uh, familiarity with um, public health, public health measures, as well as disease and uh, uh, disease and control and prevention measures. Um, in that same year, there was a, a protest against what was called Article 23, which would have been an amendment to Hong Kong's constitution called the Basic Law that um, basically uh, criminalizes any sort of incitement of secession or incitement of uh, independence, um, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of people were very opposed to this, uh, this article as a potential infringement on free speech and free rights. And so there were major protests against that in 2000 that um, and eventually Article 23 was put on hold uh, indefinitely. Um, but that sort of marked the start of these the sort of rebellious political culture, you might say, in, in Hong Kong. Um, during the 2010s, uh, there were some ongoing infrastructure developments, both uh, physical buildings, but also um, uh, in terms of connecting Hong Kong to its region and, and to the Greater Bay Area. Um, there were a, a lot of major developments in the 2000s and 2010s, um, which I will sort of highlight as we go on our tour. Um, and then, of course, by 2019, uh, sorry, uh, uh, 2014 um, was the next sort of major protest movement, um, which you can see in the image on the top right, which was uh, as colloquially known as the umbrella movement due to the umbrellas that were sort of used as shields um, by the protesters. But 
um, basically, uh, it was uh, in response to a, pro a proposed electoral reform um, where, whereby the central people's government in Beijing would screen candidates for electoral office. And uh, once again, many, many people were opposed to this as an infringement of their one country, two systems um, autonomy, as an infringement of their free rights. And so um, they came out in mass and occupied uh, major districts around Hong Kong. This lasted for about uh, two and a half months, and it sort of fizzled out and, and Ended, um, rather peacefully. But as we see, um, the anger and sort of the distrust never really went away because five years later in 2019, um, there were uh, large scale protests again. Um, now, these protests were in response to a proposed extradition law where um, uh, uh, people, um, uh, people who um, were criminally charged uh, in mainland China or um, other uh, sort of Chinese territories like Taiwan or Macau. Um, uh, they, uh, before this law, there was no way to extradite them from Hong Kong to these other territories. And so, um, ap but um, after the proposal, many people were nervous that this could be used as a sort of political tool to silence dissent and to um, basically, you know, uh, send anyone to mainland Chinese, the mainland Chinese justice system without any sort of basis. Um, and so uh, protests were once again, um, sent out in mass. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> but by 2020 and 2021, um, these protests have sort of died down, uh, especially um, due to the COVID-19 related restrictions on things like public gathering. And, um, and, and yeah, that sort of thing. So um, so um, that was sort of originally used as the pretense for uh, for uh, shutting down the protests. But also uh, more recently in 2020, uh, 2021, um, there was the new national security law that was passed. Um, Sorry, this, uh, let me think. Yeah, uh, sorry, this was 2020. 2020 was the national security law um, that was passed. And uh, uh, this um, was basically similar to Article 23 that was proposed in 2003 that um, sort of criminalizes any kind of um, uh, incitement of secession or subversion of government. Um, and it's got very, very broad language and very, very serious consequences. So um, the main effect of it has been to, that um, sort of people have started to self-censor and different groups have started to um, disband uh, in response to it. Um, so that's just a, a brief history of, of Hong Kong. And um, again, I'll go over some of the little points in more in detail as we go on our journey, but I do wanna sort of get our tour started so I can actually show you uh, some of the places on the ground. Um, and so today where we'll be going is, uh, we'll start at um, Lantau Island over here on the Eastern part of Hong Kong. Um, it's right by Hong Kong's International Airport. And it's got um, some nice sort of nature and historical sites, uh, uh, those type of things. And then um, we'll come over to uh, Hong Kong Island, which is sort of the central Hong Kong area. Um, if you think of like an analogy to New York, it's kind of the Manhattan sort of heart of the city. Um, after spending some time there, we'll go uh, just north to Kowloon, which again, if you're familiar with New York, it's kind of like more the Brooklyn or, or these outer boroughs of the city. And uh, then we will finally go up north to the new territories and explore a couple of spots there. Um, and then finally, I just want to conclude um, uh, right at this sort of northern border with Shenzhen and just sort of um, put it once again into, into a larger context and, um, and sort of think about the relationship between Hong Kong and mainland China um, rather than just focusing on, on the city itself. Um, probably the best and easiest way to get around is with the Hong Kong MTR, which is the mass transit railway. Um, it's uh, one of the best metro systems I've ever experienced. Um, it's very, very efficient, very quick. Um, it connects all the major districts and uh, spots in the city that you might be interested in seeing. Um, and the average price is uh, only anywhere from like maybe, you know, 30 cents to $2, depending on the distance. It's a sort of pay as you go um, type of, of fare system. Um, and it has famously a 99.9% .9 on time rating, uh, like uh, arrival rate and uh, serves about 5 million passengers every day. So very, very huge, massive and efficient system. Um, if you go during rush hour, you know, you'll see there's trains coming like every 30 seconds that are all equally like full of people, but um, that just shows you how, how efficient and quick um, the system runs. Uh, when you use the MTR, you'll need an octopus card, which is this, and you can see it in the photo here. Um, you just uh, upload money onto it during, like using some uh, vending machines, or you can also go 
go to a convenience store like 7-Eleven and, and they will upload money onto your Octopus card. Um, and this can be used not only on the MTR, but also on buses, um, at, even at most like convenience stores and restaurants. Um, if you've got a lot of money on your, um, on your Octopus card, you can pay you know, a restaurant bill with the Octopus card. Um, so it's a very, very ubiquitous um, tool and definitely something that you'll want to have when you come and visit. Hey Chris, um, um, sorry to interrupt. Um, is there any oh yeah. uh, possibility of removing those um, gray bars on the top? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, is it? Yeah, now they're more out of the way. If the oh, one okay. yeah, is I can... a bit, okay. but um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. sorry about that. I guess those are my, um, you know, the the controls, like how, you know, the annotations and, and whatnot. So mm -hmm. yeah, I definitely don't need them, but I don't know if there's a way to minimize them. So I'll just try and, and keep them uh, up there as best I can. And just a reminder to everyone, uh, the mm -hmm. Q&A um, section is there for you to ask anything you need clarity on. So go ahead and utilize that resource. Keep going, Chris. It's awesome. Awesome, thanks. Um, just a couple other modes that are very popular. So um, buses, they uh, are, are very uh, ubiquitous and they are the sort of double-decker style buses that you could find um, again, like in, in London and in the UK. So another sort of legacy of British influence there. Um, the minibus systems are um, quite uh, fun, but you uh, they're a bit more kind of local. These ones go on a fixed route, but they don't have fixed stops. So if you want to get off somewhere, you'll have to tell the driver, usually in, in Cantonese, uh, you know, as best you can to stop the minibus and uh, so you can get off um, where you're trying to go. Um, and then there's taxis. Taxis are generally quite affordable, but again, uh, most drivers might not, might not speak English or might only speak a very little bit of English. So um, it might be best to just look up the translation of your destination before you get into the taxi or at least have a, a business card with your hotel address or Google Maps of, of where you're trying to go before you go into the taxi. Um, I find Google Maps is a really handy source. Um, you just type in where you're trying to go and it will give you all the different options and how much they cost and how long it takes to get there. Um, so not just Hong Kong, but wherever you go, that's a very handy resource um, for getting around. <clears throat> all right, so let's see. Let's start our um, uh, tour on Lantau Island, which uh, here it is a little bit more zoomed in. Specifically, we will take a look at this new bridge, the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge that uh, is on the eastern side of the island, just opened in 2018. Um, then we'll take a tour of uh, Tai O, which is a more traditional uh, Hong Kong type, uh, type of fishing village. Um, we will go back to Tong Chong, which is the main urban district, the main built up uh, district of Lantau. And then we'll go on a short um, uh, ride to the, uh, there's a giant Buddha statue um, there. There's a beach on the southern end of Lantau, um, as well as a, uh, another sort of residential enclave and hiking trails that we'll, we'll explore. So first is just the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge. This was built in 2018, so it's a very new feature, and it's the largest sea, the longest um, sea crossing in the world at 55 kilometers. Um, a lot of analysts sort of interpret this as a kind of physical um, uh, manifestation of China being linked to, uh, sorry, of Hong Kong being linked to mainland China and to the territory of Macau. Um, and so even though this, um, you know, the return on investment of such a massive infrastructure project is a little bit um, uncertain still, um, you know, many people are saying that it's not really about the economic benefits so much as it is about the sort of symbolic gesture of um, connecting um, Hong Kong to uh, mainland China as a sort of, uh, I've been heard it described as like an umbilical cord to the, the mother land in some way. This will be directly visible if you fly into Hong Kong airport and you if you have a window seat and look down you could actually see this really really long road just um, expanding across the sea. Um, after taking a look at the bridge we can go to the far end of Lantau Island to the Tai O fishing village. Um, this is one of the uh, few ex uh, examples of a kind of older um, village lifestyle and, and development that 
that was here sort of pre um, uh, like pre 1900s um, uh, times. Um, so this is a, a sort of famous, um, it used to be a salt producing and fishing area. Now it's mostly for like tourists uh, and tourist uh, economy is mostly based on tourism. Um, and unfortunately I never got the chance to go here just because it was so remote. So I took a, a stock photo from the Guardian for, for this image. Um, we did try to go one day during a day trip and we, we went to Tung Chung, uh, which is sort of by the airport and tried to hike there, but it was just so long and it was really, really hot that we ended up um, just taking a boat back to Tung Chong. Um, on that hike, though, we did see some other sort of smaller temples and, and traditional villages. Um, so uh, if you're looking for some of that more like historical uh, kind of culture, um, you know, Lantau Island has a lot of that to offer. You can get there by walking or hiking, like I said, but there are also multiple ferries that go there. So we probably should have done this in the first place, just take the ferry boat. But uh, <laughs> the ferry, um, once you're in Tong Chong, one of the ma uh, major attractions is the Nongping cable car um, or Nongping 360. Um, this is the entrance to it. You can go on and, and get on the cable car and it has some really, really stunning views of, um, of Lantau Island and of, of the airport and, and the mountains. Um, I will warn you though, that if you're afraid of heights, you know this is probably not the best um, activity for you because you can just see how high up we are in this cable car. And it is a little bit you know, rickety if the wind blows, you, know, you can feel the, the cable car kind of swaying. Um, and then here in this shot, you can see the, the Hong Kong airports uh, in, the, in the background on the left there. Uh, it continues going through these really, really high mountains across Lantau. And, um, you know, the topography of the mountains, it just sort of shows you why Hong Kong is so dense and why it's so difficult to build additional housing uh, in the territory, just because, you know, even if the, if the government um, really invested a lot of efforts into it, it's just physically quite difficult due to the topography. Um, after a few, like maybe 10 or 15 minutes in the cable car, we'll start to see the Buddha statue. This is the Tian Tan Buddha. Um, and um, yeah, Tian Tan Buddha. Um, and then once you arrive, uh, we can see there's like a small sort of uh, village and monastery um, that leads up to the Buddha. And so this is a, a great place to get some little souvenirs or some uh, local snacks. Um, I remember we had one snack that uh, was almost like a Rice Krispie treat. It has a lot of uh, puffed rice balls and uh, that were sort of stuck together with honey, uh, which was very, very tasty. And um, uh, then you can climb up, I think it's like something like 200 uh, or 80, 200, 200, 300 steps up to the top. So it is a bit of a hike to get to the, the Buddha statue, but it can give you some really nice views of the surrounding area. And then there were also uh, some sort of uh, semi-domestic cows. They look like they're domestic, but they were not in any sort of like pen or, you know, they weren't tied to anything. They're just walking around the village, um, which was also quite cool to see. Uh, and then there's also some nice beaches on Lantau. So on a different trip, we went to the southern part of Lantau to these beaches. And as you can see, um, it's very, very pristine um, and quiet. So if you're looking for a beach that has like restaurants where you can buy a drink or something to enjoy, this might not be the best one. But if you're looking for a sort of quiet uh, space to relax, that's a great, um, great choice. And then on a, on a different trip to Lantau, we went on a, 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 a very long hike from, um, there's, uh, there's a sort of um, a village or enclave called Discovery Bay um, that is a bit more catering to the affluent uh, Hong Kong society where you can have sort of these private detached single family homes uh, as well as like, you know, a private beach and, and that sort of thing. And only mostly accessible by a boat from Central Hong Kong. So it's like a very central Hong Kong. And this is and then from there we started to hike up the mountains and it was a very very long hike and, and about halfway through it got quite foggy and rainy and um, just not the best weather but as you can see from the top there's some really really beautiful views uh, that's the airport in the distance and then just nothing but mountain tops and, and kind of for miles so if hiking is your thing, this is kind of going to be a recurring theme, I think, in this uh, 
uh, I realized how much hiking there is. But uh, yeah, there's there's good. Uh, it's a great Hong Kong's a great place if if you like that sort of thing. And then finally, of course, there's the Hong Kong Disneyland. Um, I won't spend too much time on it because it is similar to other Disneylands around the world. It's got your main street. It's got the different little districts around the park, the teacups. Um, and unfortunately, when we went there, uh, the castle was um, was still was was being uh, renovated. I guess it's being expanded um, because actually, this Hong Kong Disneyland is, I think, the smallest Disneyland in the world. And um, it and I think partly as a result, it's been um, you know operating at a net loss and had very few tourists coming uh, for for quite some uh, many years. But um, now they're undergoing some expansion projects, uh, including the renovation, I guess, of the of the Princess Castle. All right, so that's a little bit about Lantau. Um, now we're going to go uh, to the main district of Hong Kong, which is Hong Kong Island. And we'll start in Central, which is the red dot there. Um, it's sort of the central business district where a lot of old colonial buildings and government buildings are. And then we will work our way up to Hong Kong, uh, the, uh, what are called the mid-level. So basically, um, you know, the central Hong Kong is right up against a mountain slope and people have slowly built up along the slope of the mountain. Uh, and so those areas are called the mid-levels. And uh, we'll also eventually make it up to the top to uh, Victoria Peak. Um, and then uh, on the way back down, we will stop at um, more towards, towards the middle of Hong Kong Island, which is an area called Causeway Bay and uh, Times Square and uh, also to uh, Victoria Park, which is sort of the central park of Hong Kong. Um, finally, I'll just show you like an example uh, residence at North Point, um, uh, which is a more residential area. Um, this is where one of my friends was living, for example. And um, then again, a couple of hiking spots, both um, uh, uh, one is called Suma Shan and one is called uh, Dragon's Back. And then again, a beach on the southern part of Hong Kong Island. So, um, so if you when you first arrive, probably the one of the first places you'll go to Hong Kong uh, in Hong Kong is Central. Um, it's the Central Business District. As you can see, it's a very um, bustling area with a lot of uh, skyscrapers, headquarters of many many banks. Uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange is headquartered here. <laughs> Sorry if it's, if it's quite loud. <laughs> um, and then, of course, there's a lot of uh, shopping malls in the area as well. So mostly in Central, you can find um, a lot of luxury goods uh, if, if that's what you're into buying. But um, across Hong Kong, it's very common to find shopping malls, especially um, linked to residential estates, um, as, sort of as an anchor for um, business um, that goes on in these uh, residential estates. A very common um, sort of setup for residences in Hong Kong is to have a metro station at the bottom and then a mall on top of it with restaurants and shops and then a sort of park on top of the mall and then many residential towers that are really, really huge um, on top of the park and on top of the mall. So that's a sort of typical um, Hong Kong estates layout. Um, also at Central is the Central Ferry Terminal, where you can catch boats to outlying islands, as well as to uh, international places such as mainland China or Macau. Um, we took a boat, uh, a day trip one time to Lama Island, which is one of the smaller outlying islands here in red, just uh, south of, of the main Hong Kong Island. Um, and similar to the Tai O village in, Hong, uh, in Lantau, at the Lama Island, you can see some of the more um, uh, traditional like housing, traditional villages. Um, you can get some unique food uh, and, and see some unique sites there. Um, and so there's a few really cool outlying islands that you can make a day trip out of. Um, one of the cool things on Hong Kong Island that you should definitely try is uh, it's called the Ding Ding Tram, and it's just called a Ding Ding sort of colloquially as the because it makes the like there's a bell sound that goes Ding Ding, and this is a, again a legacy of the colonial era that are still in use today. Um, these double decker, very narrow um, trams that go just across the island from the central districts on the west uh, uh, eastern side all the way to the western side. Here's just what it looks like if you get to sit up in front with a, with a nice view. This is what it looks like as you sort of go through the, the dense urban jungle um, of Hong Kong. Yeah, and as then if, if you, I don't know if you heard it, but um, 
all of the announcements. This is the same in the buses and in the transit systems are trilingual, uh, usually just in Cantonese, in English, and in Mandarin, cater to all of the different international tourists who might be there. So uh, after Central, um, we can go up a little bit to the mid-levels, which is a really cool way to sort of see the city from different angles. And one of the best ways to, to go there is through this uh, mid-levels escalator. So they literally built like a series of escalators um, that are completely free. You just go on and, and in the, you know, in the evening rush hour, it goes up. And then in the morning rush hour, the escalators run down. Um, but uh, this is a very cool way to like see the city from some different perspectives and of course um, save yourself the, the tired, you know, save yourself some energy from having to hike up uh, such a steep slope. Um, this is kind of again what it looks like and then by the time you you get high enough you can uh, on the right I took this picture here you can you can sort of see um, down uh, you know towards the central district um, from a really from some really cool um, perspectives. Um, and then once you're at the mid levels, there are some like cool hiking trails and jogging trails and some of them really just go right up to the edge of the city so it's almost like you feel like you're you're walking on you're on a sky bridge or something like that because um, you're just you're even though you're on the ground you're you're still taller than a lot of these multi story skyscrapers and you can sort of see over over them and, and across uh, you get really nice panoramic views of the city. And then if you keep going up and up and you and you hike high enough, you can finally get to Victoria Peak, which is the tallest point in Hong Kong. And uh, it's where I took those uh, the, the picture uh, at the beginning. Um, you can get really, really beautiful panoramic views, um, especially like this is about dusk time. And then at nighttime, when all the lights on the buildings turn on, um, it's really, really uh, dazzling to see um, the, the cityscape, um, as well as the sort of the background mountains behind it. Um, so just again, to give you the perspective, in the foreground, there is Hong Kong Island, and then across the water, across Victoria Harbor, is Kowloon, which we'll go to uh, in just a moment. Um, if you don't want to hike up, another great way to get to the Victoria Peak is with the Peak Tram, and this is also uh, was built by the British, I think, in 1888, and it's still in operation today. Um, when my mom and brother came, we, we took this tram, I think, I think we took a bus up and then we took the tram down. So now there's a, a variety of ways that you can get to Victoria Peak without having to hike too much. Um, and if you want a more historical option, this is definitely a great way to do it. Um, there's also some hikes like from Victoria Peak, you can go along the mountain slopes, uh, you could go west um, or south, and so one of the other hikes that we did was going a bit west. Um, this picture is kind of cool, you can see in the middle of it there's some ships uh, that are just sort of docked out there, and, and they're of course waiting for the, um, the trading uh, ports, the Hong Kong port, which is this massive port on the Kowloon side of Hong Kong. Um, but yeah, this, this particular hike will give you a nice view of that. <clears throat> Moving on a bit to more of the central area to Causeway Bay and Times Square. So Causeway Bay is a famous shopping district of uh, Hong Kong. And just like the Times Square in New York, it's very, very, it's expensive. I think it's, it's probably the most expensive like real estate uh, in the world, actually. Um, it's got some uh, really cool um, uh, like malls. Uh, a lot of them are very vertically oriented. So if uh, on the picture on the right, you can see this is from a, a mall, but we were on the like 12th floor or something um, looking down onto the narrow streets below. <clears throat> and here's again, just sort of like the city state of Causeway Bay. Yeah, Causeway Bay, you know, is, is um, you can feel kind of the energy and, and the, uh, even during COVID time when, when there was lockdowns and all the doors were sealed, you know, there would always be huge, uh, dense crowds of people around the city. Um, and as Causeway Bay is such a major uh, central part of the city, it was also a major site of where protests uh, and rallies would be held. So, um, for example, one of the rallies was held at a mall here in Times Square. Um, and this one was sort of very subdued and very peaceful. It just consisted of people coming together and sort of chanting slogans and also singing. Uh, there's a protest anthem that became popular in uh, the end of 2019, which I'll just play a bit for you. Um, here. Um, 
Yeah, so the song they're singing is, uh, is called Glory to Hong Kong. It was an anonymously written um, anthem sort of for the protest movement that became very, very popular towards the end of the movement. And, um, uh, you know, there's a version on YouTube if you want to listen to the, to the whole thing. Um, but uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, just even being there, you can feel kind of how powerful that solidarity was. And, and um, you know, even if you can't really speak the language or you don't understand the, the slogans, um, you can really kind of feel the, the passion and the energy at these sites. Um, but not all the protests were sort of, uh, you know, just uh, like that one was a sort of small scale in, in one time deal in a mall. Um, a lot of them would also originate in Causeway Bay and march down the, the major road to Central. And so one of the days, um, uh, here's a, a shot of one of those um, marches. And of course, um, anytime there were these marches, they're technically all kind of unauthorized. And so there would be a very heavy police presence. Um, and as, as you can see, the police, there's not just the typical uniforms, but they're wearing the, the riot uniforms, which are very like uh, kind of militant, uh, militaristic in their aesthetic. And also behind um, these particular officers, you can see there's a uh, like a truck that shoots a, a water cannon as a sort of means of crowd control. <clears throat> And then in this shot, uh, in the distance, you know, it's, it's quite, maybe it's hard to see, but um, there's a, a slight bridge and underneath the bridge, there's a bit of smoke. And um, that's the use of tear gas, which became very, very common um, as a response by the police to the protests, especially towards the latter, um, like the latter half of 2019 uh, to 2020. Um, another uh, uh, significant area close to Causeway Bay is Victoria Park, um, and, and in relation to the protest movement, what this is mostly known for is the site of a June 4th memorial, which used to happen um, every year. Uh, June 4th is the date of the Tiananmen Square massacre in mainland China of, uh, of 1989, and um, it's sort of been erased from the national memory in mainland China. So, you know, mentions of it are not really tolerated, you know, memorials are not really tolerated. Um, but for a long time in Hong Kong, because of the free speech and the civil society, um, it was allowed to have uh, the vigils here for the June 4th, um, uh, for the Tiananmen Square massacre victims. Uh, so this is June 4th, 20, uh, 2020. Um, and you can just see how many people are like, coming to the park, working on candles and um, just rallying together. And, I think what's significant about this crowd and this event is that uh, once again, like like similar uh, rally, it was unauthorized by the police and the government. Um, however, in this particular instance, um, the police sort of like didn't, uh, were not really uh, enforcing the, the ban very uh, rigorously and sort of let people come sort of, uh, as long as they were peaceful, sort of come, pay their respects and go, um, rather than heavily enforce the social distancing ban. That was the reason for, um, yeah, for canceling the, the gathering. Um, I'm just trying to be a bit mindful of the time. So I'm gonna just go through the rest of these, uh, of Hong Kong Island pretty quickly so we can get on to some of the other parts of Hong Kong. Um, but uh, this is a more residential area, North Point and Taiku. Um, you can see that even in residences, like they're all, it's a very high rise lifestyle and they're all very, very densely packed. So you don't have a lot of uh, personal space um, in your own, in, in the housing units there. And, you know, you can see views of many, many buildings around. Um, and as I mentioned, most of the estates will have some sort of park or public space, at least um, on the ground level for the residences, uh, residents to use. And then just a bit more about hikes. Of course, one of the great things about Hong Kong is like every district and every island has some great hikes that you can go on. So uh, this, for example, although it's a hazy day, you get some really cool views. Um, this was from Suma Shan, uh, which means like little horse mountain. I guess it looks like a little horse. And uh, here you get a nice view of the sunset over Victoria Harbor. And it's so nice that there's all of these photographers there uh, taking pictures of that, of that sunset. <clears throat> And then there's um, Dragon's Back at the very tip of Hong Kong uh, Island. It's named that way because of the way the mountain is shaped. It kind of looks like the back of, of a dragon, the sort of scaly back. And then the, the hiking trail just goes along the top. So hence the name uh, Dragon's Back. 
Um, and one thing, if you ever go on the hikes in Hong Kong, one thing to be mindful of is there, uh, it is kind of wilderness. There are wild animals. And so if you look uh, here, they have these banners that is basically saying, don't feed the pigs, don't feed wild animals. Um, there are a lot of wild boars, which actually really frightened me because a lot of them are really, really huge and, and they can behave in unpredictable ways. But beyond the boars, there's also, uh, it's common to find monkeys, um, birds and other, other wildlife. So just something to keep in mind if you do go on the hike there. And then finally, um, uh, just like Lama, uh, sorry, Lantau Island, there are beaches on Hong Kong Island. Um, these ones tend to be a, be a bit more like catered for tourists. So they'll have some restaurants, the shops and bars and things nearby. So if you wanna grab a drink and sit on the beach and enjoy the, the summer day, um, this uh, another great spot to do that. All right, and so having gone to Hong Kong Island, now we can go to the Kowloon Peninsula. And this is it once again, zoomed in. We'll start at the edge of Kowloon, just across from Hong Kong Island. And over there, there's some uh, there's a nice promenade with some great city views, as well as a lot of museums and cultural sites. Then we'll go a bit more inland to a district called Mong Kok, which is one of the densest, I think some people say it's the densest like human settlements in the entire world. There's just so many people there in such a small area, um, but it, it's very, very busy and bustling. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, and then I'll also take you to a couple sort of urban oases. I like to think of them. They're kind of these parks that are perched upon hilltops or small mountains that allow you to sort of get a breather away from the hustle and bustle of the city a little bit. And then um, a little more inland in Kowloon, I'll show you an example of the uh, uh, like a Lenin wall, which is a sort of protest or art, um, like it, it showcases protest artwork during the movement. And then finally, um, we'll end it with like end our tour of Kowloon with a discussion about one of the um, like uh, major, major pro uh, moments in the protest movement, which happened at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, um, which I'll talk about in just a sec. But um, to get to uh, Kowloon or between, uh, between Central uh, Hong Kong Island and Kowloon, one of the best ways to get there is with this Star Ferry. So similar to the Ding Ding trams, this has been in operation since the 1800s. Um, <laughs> these ones, these trips are really, really great because they cost about two, two to four Hong Kong dollars, which is like 25 to 50 cents. US sense and uh, they, they come and go every like 10 or 15 minutes and you also get to sort of ride on a piece of history here. Um, and of course it gives you really, really beautiful harbor views. So even though it's longer than the MTR, which is like a two minute train ride underneath the harbor, um, this is sort of a more scenic and, and um, fun way to get between the island and Kowloon. Um, on the uh, TST promenade, so TST means Tim Sa Toy, but most locals will just say TST because that name is like famously hard to pronounce uh, for English speakers. Um, you can get some really, really nice views of the whole harbor and with Hong Kong Island in the background. So here's just a quick panorama of, uh, of the Hong Kong skyline. Um, and then of course in the back there behind all those buildings is Victoria Peak where we were just a few moments ago. Uh, and then also, if you get lucky, you can spot some of the Hong Kong, the, the old, they call them junk boats, because um, I'm not exactly sure why it's called a junk boat, but these are some of the old boats that were used during the, uh, also during the colonial times that uh, there are still a few in use today. And of course, as beautiful as the skyline is, it gets immensely more beautiful at night as well, um, even if it's hard to take some pictures of it. And uh, as I mentioned before, there's some new malls uh, that have been opening. Um, you know, I won't waste too much time on this. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so that's um, the Tsim Sa Choi Promenade. Um, right next to it is a new district that's kind of being created called the West Kowloon um, Cultural District. This is home to a lot of new museums, including a new art museum that just opened up this week, I think. Um, and of course, there's of course like some controversy over it still because of uh, questions about censorship and uh, when it comes to the art uh, showcasing. So for example, I think they decided not to showcase some of the art by um, the Chinese dissident artist Ai Weiwei, um, and partly due to like political fears, I think. So um, they're, they're very excited about this new arts and cultural district, but I think there are some questions that remain about 
um, you know, the freedom associated with, uh, with a cultural practice. So this is the new M plus museum that just opened and it's absolutely massive. I think they said it's about twice the size of the Tate Modern in London. Um, but again, it's a question, can, you know, size and, and um, you know, money itself um, like uh, be enough to offset questions about censorship. And finally, there's this um, high speed rail station in West Kowloon as well. So this is another example of the recent infrastructure project. Um, it finished in 2018 and it's a high speed rail link that directly connects um, Hong Kong with uh, Shenzhen and the rest of uh, mainland China's extensive high speed rail network. Um, and so while many people see this as like an important addition to the city's like infrastructure and transport uh, infrastructure, um, there were a lot of questions about you know, the, the necessity of it. And also um, the fact that there's a certain section of the train station that is technically, you know, mainland Chinese sovereign territory as often works with border checkpoints and that sort of thing. Um, there was some controversy over the shared, uh, shared um, checkpoint here at the Hong Kong high-speed rail terminus. Um, now, this is currently closed. I think it's been closed since COVID. So it's kind of a moot point right now, but at the time it was a bit controversial. Um, and so now moving in a bit more to Mong Kok and um, the sort of dense urban jungle of Kowloon. And so if you've ever watched those like Wong Kar Wai films or are familiar with the neon landscape of Hong Kong or the sort of cyberpunk genre that the Hong Kong cityscape has um, uh, fostered, this is sort of the place where it all began in uh, Kowloon in Mong Kok. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's just a very, very dense and bustling um, uh, zone. And then this is Nathan Road, which is the main north-south road that kind of cuts through it all and um, is the main thoroughfare for getting up and down um, uh, Kowloon Peninsula. Um, there's a lot of different shopping places. There's um, outdoor markets. So this is an example of uh, a market where you can go and um, buy pretty much anything that you would ever need uh, is being sold here, but you do have to practice your bartering skills because um, you're meant to really try and negotiate down the price and uh, really, you know, do the back and forth of the bartering in exchange at these, uh, at these stalls. Um, it's got some of these foot bridges that um, I also think can give you some really cool, uh, beautiful views of the city um, and also sort of get cut above like a lot of the hustle and bustle of the street uh, at the street level. And there's some uh, beautiful, like, uh, or, or there's some like really great uh, um, live performances, or they call them buskers, who will uh, throughout throughout this district they will come out and play different music and songs. Um, <clears throat> so as you can see, yeah, they're just uh, the set. and it's very very popular, I think, with uh, like, a lot of people who are shopping might just come and stop by and, and watch those performances. Um, I think when, at the time that I was there, you could definitely feel a kind of heightened security presence. So any day that there would be kind of events like uh, like plans for rallies or plans for um, you know gatherings or protests, um, the police would usually find out about it beforehand and deploy sort of a really massive police response to the area and just try and prevent any sort of rallies or gatherings from happening in the first place. So um, it was not uncommon to see sites like this where you just see sort of officers on standby scattered throughout uh, throughout the city. Um, and sometimes uh, if there were protests, um, a common tactic of the police would be to sort of gather, uh, to sort of cordon off the different blocks and gather everyone uh, together and sort of search people one by one and look for suspicious items or look for, um, you know, maybe posters with, with banned slogans or, or um, evidence of um, uh, intent to do damage, that sort of thing. Um, so in these moments, it could get very intense and um, yeah, like, you know, uh, definitely like heightened emotions and, and that sort of thing. Um, if you are unlucky to get caught in, in that sort of operation. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll show a bit of this. This is, uh, it might be a bit, you know, intense for, for some viewers, but it's uh, just basically, you can see the police trying to gather. Um, but, you know, as intense as that seemed, it was actually 
you know, it's not even a, it was not even like a newsworthy thing at the time. It didn't even really make the headlines. Um, that was uh, at the time I was there, that sort of had become almost a part of like everyday life or, or weekly life, um, at least during uh, 20, 2020, earlier part of 2020. Um, yeah, those types of rallies and that police response was definitely very common. Um, um, a couple other features about uh, Kowloon are these like really iconic neon streetscapes that you can find in a lot of places. Um, it's sort of been on the decline, I guess, since the rise of like other technology, LED and that sort of thing, but um, it's still like a core part of the heritage there. Um, and then if you've had enough with like the hustle and bustle of the intense street life, you can always uh, take a breather at one of the different uh, hilltop parks. Um, that are around Kowloon. And so uh, I really loved these, like just going up here and um, getting some really nice views of the city. And uh, these are much less intense hikes than some of the other ones. They're only about like uh, 10 minutes to get to the top and you can get some really nice views of uh, the surrounding city. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, and then um, also in Kowloon, it was common to see some of the protest art. Again, this is sort of more um, towards the start of the movement rather than um, recently when, when such displays are now kind of effectively banned. Um, but yeah, this is definitely, uh, you know, these were powerful like um, installations that you could kind of see just around the city. This is against uh, a wall of kind of like a, a mountainside and there's a wall against the mountainside and people would just um, write graffiti or uh, put up posters, that sort of thing. And then finally, um, Hong Kong Polytechnic University uh, is also in Kowloon. And this was kind of a major site, uh, kind of sort of a final, almost like a final stand of the protest movement, at least the tactic of the protest movement to have mass rallies and gatherings and things. Um, so a lot of uh, protesters went into the university and barricaded the entryways. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and um, sort of this was a, a very dramatic escalation of the tactics used by the radical protesters from the more peaceful um, rallies and, and street marches that were done before. This is a major cross harbor tunnel where uh, vehicles drive between Hong Kong Island and Kowloon. And as you can see, uh, this was also kind of barricaded and there was absolutely no traffic coming through the cross harbor tunnel there. Um, this is uh, actually almost two years ago to the day, like this is uh, November of 2019. All right, and I know I'm running very short on time, so I'll just try to go quickly through the new territories. Um, there's not as many kind of like tourist destinations to see here, so I think I can go through it kind of quickly. Um, but um, uh, a lot of the cool, cool sites to see in the new territories are these country parks, these really nice hikes and, um, uh, you know, uh, those types of things. One of them... I was going to show all the dots again. Sorry, give me one second. Uh, one of them is a famous Lion Rock Country Park named after the uh, shape of the rock. It looks like a lion and you can see some really gorgeous views of the city, uh, uh, both Kowloon, which is in the foreground, as well as Hong Kong Island in the background there. Um, there's also a variety of, uh, they call them new towns scattered throughout the new territory. So because housing was such a, is such a short supply in, um, in the rest of Hong Kong, uh, recently a uh, solution to the housing shortage has been to build kind of these new developments within the new territories that are very high density, usually have some malls and parks, as I mentioned, um, as a sort of um, effective solution to the housing um, shortage. Um, so here's an example of those developments. They tend to be pretty standardized with a base and then like a few towers on top. But it's still a pretty nice uh, and comfortable, you know, nice, comfortable apartments. One of my friends lived in one of these. And uh, this is the view from his, his window where you can see the new town um, you know, in, in the surrounding mountains. Another area shot in is the 10,000 Buddhist monastery. So um, uh, this is actually not a monastery. I think it's just a temple, but they call it 10,000 Buddhist monastery. And you can see just some of the, like a lot of the Buddhist sculptures lining the pathway up. And then once you get to the top, there's a lot of uh, golden sculptures within the temple as well. Um, and then if you really want to get like remote and into the wilderness, there's the Sai Kung Country Park, which is on the far um, western end of Hong Kong. And so uh, one of the weekends we did like a camping trip here. Um, and it was very, very, it takes a few hours to get there. You have to go to the, the train and then take a bus and then take a taxi. And finally, if the, the driver agrees to take you, um, you know, you go quite a long way into the interior of the park. 
And um, uh, on the way, you can see this is like a massive uh, freshwater reservoir that is used for uh, water for the city. And once we got there, we went to the to the beach and pitched our tents and you know had a very nice kind of camping experience um, along with some other folks. And another little park is called Thousand Islands, uh, kind of as the name implies, it's, uh, it's a dammed um, reservoir that gave rise to some little islands uh, in, that have popped out in the reservoir. So, so that's what that is. All right, and so we are now uh, pretty much done through most of Hong Kong. Uh, so now just I'll, I'll take you briefly to um, Shenzhen, which is where I lived before I went to Hong Kong. I was living in Shenzhen for a couple of years and would frequently come to visit. And I would go through this exact kind of process where I would take a bus and um, the, uh, the bus would go uh, to a border crossing, which I will show you here. This is the Shenzhen and um, Hong Kong border. Uh, it's called Shenzhen Bay border crossing. And um, this is one of the busiest ones. And I think it's one of the only ones that is still open now during COVID time. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of people coming with like bags. So quite a few people who live in Shenzhen or mainland China will go to Hong Kong and do some shopping there because oftentimes the taxes are lower and there's a less um, likelihood of uh, like uh, contaminated or, or counterfeit goods uh, in Hong Kong. I think now it's not as bad, but maybe in the 2000s and 2010s, there was a, a great fear of counterfeit goods or um, contaminated goods, especially like, for example, baby formula, milk. Um, so a lot of people in Shenzhen would go to Hong Kong and come back, you know, do these sort of day trips. It was also very common to see school children. So a lot of Shenzhen student, like school kids would go to school in Hong Kong and basically you would around 3 p.m. every day, you would see these massive groups of, of students um, coming and going through the border crossing, just as sort of a part of, of daily life. And, you know, I thought that's so fascinating to see um, that this border is, is really almost, um, yeah, it's just a, like another part of daily life to a lot of people um, who live here. And uh, coming back to Hong Kong, you know, we go through the, the border crossing again. And um, just one of the cool things here, so in the mainland, in mainland China, everyone drives on the right-hand side, but because of the British colonial influence in Hong Kong, everyone in Hong Kong drives on the left-hand side. And so when you're leaving Shenzhen to go to Hong Kong and you're about to cross this uh, Shenzhen Bay Bridge, the roads kind of uh, diverge and, and so the right-hand side uh, sort of comes on the left and then the left-hand side uh, goes on the right. And this is sort of the view as you're leaving Shenzhen and entering Hong Kong. And then very, very briefly, food, uh, nightlife. Um, so uh, this is some just traditional uh, Cantonese um, cuisine. So dim sum, if, you, if you're familiar with that, it's like little snacks um, that are really nice for tea time or lunch. Um, they go, uh, yeah, so you can have like your pork buns here or egg tart buns. Um, also dumplings, sticky rice, tofu. These are all very common like dim sum foods. Um, but a great, um, one of my favorite places to eat when I was in Hong Kong was called a cha chan ting, which is like a Hong Kong style like diner. If you think of, you know, in America, we have our diners. Um, this is sort of the Hong Kong version. So um, all of the food is very, very fast. Um, it's not exactly the healthiest, but it's very, very cheap. And you go there and it's just very, very bustling. The, the, you sit down and, and the waiter doesn't even say, you know, hi, how are you? It's, it's right down to business. They just say, what do you want? You know, what do you want to drink? Write it all down. Um, some of the iconic foods are this Hong Kong style French toast, which is like a deep fried French toast, basically, with like lots and lots of butter. Um, Hong Kong egg tarts, um, the, and then behind the egg tart is the like pineapple bun. Um, it's not, uh, it doesn't taste like pineapple. I think it's because of the shape. It looks like pineapple, but um, it's really, really sweet and tasty. Um, then there's a variety of like noodle dishes. Uh, so fried noodles or noodle soups. Um, and oftentimes they'll have like a meat on top, such as like cha siu, which is like a barbecue glazed pork or um, satay beef, that sort of thing they'll mix with the soup. And then another uh, legacy of the British influence you can see is the milk, uh, milk tea. So in mainland China, most people don't put milk in tea, but in Hong Kong, it's very, very common to see the Hong Kong style milk tea, um, both at uh, Cha Shan Tang's as well as like tea stalls or tea shops um, around the city. Um, and then uh, one thing though, there is a lot of international cuisine in Hong Kong. So you'll never sort of like 
uh, you know, be short of food that, that you like. Um, you can get any sort of cuisine pretty much in the world. Uh, you can see here a connection to Chicago. There's Chicago Dan Ryan's Grill, which was like randomly at one of the malls that we went to in Hong Kong. So, you know, that was cool to get a taste of home. Um, but other really popular options are Japanese cuisine. So sushi, ramen, um, as well as Korean cuisine, such as like barbecue, uh, you know, Korean bar uh, barbecued um, foods. And uh, there was also like this very, very famous or delicious like French creperie um, that was operated by a French expat who lives in Hong Kong. So we went there a couple of times. Uh, and then there's also some cute cafes, you know, they have cat cafes, rabbit cafes. Um, and then there's also some shops that just like their whole business model is selling desserts. So you can find these like really nice dessert um, stalls with sticky ri like rice balls and uh, ice cream, that sort of thing. One thing about the food culture when I was there was that uh, a lot of restaurants were kind of labeled as yellow or blue. This was another influence of the protest movement um, where uh, like yellow shops meant that the owners of the restaurants support the movement and usually have posters and signs up kind of like you see in this image. And other shops were labeled as blue if they supported the police or the government and um, people would sort of open source uh, put on, on like onto open source maps which shops were yellow and which shops were blue. Um, um, and even though this was really like denounced by the government and denounced by the the central, you know, the Communist Party or whatever, um, this was a very like popular tactic of resistance um, through economic patronage. Um, nightlife, you know, if you want some really good high rise like views of the city, there's options for those. This is one in uh, Hong Kong Island. And then here's a view from uh, here's the view from Kowloon side. There's another one that we went to. There's also some more small, like local, really cute bars, but with really fancy drinks and nice decor, as well as like LGBT plus um, nightlife. So this is like a drag show at one of the gay bars in um, the nightlife district. And then finally, arts and culture, if uh, you're into exploring museums, I mentioned there's the M Plus Museum, which just opened. But before that, they also have a Taekwun Contemporary Museum, uh, which is here and has some uh, sort of locally specific Hong Kong artwork, such as one about kind of cyberpunk aesthetics that was here. Um, there was also an exhibit about like refugee, the refugee crisis and um, migration uh, at, at Taekwun. And then this is the Hong Kong Museum of Arts, HKMOA. And they have the more kind of traditional, uh, like like nineteenth and twentieth century um, Chinese art, and they also have a really really nice panoramic view of uh, Victoria Harbor, here. Um, and then at the time, one of the installations was also kind of you know alluded to the social movements in Hong Kong, uh, as you can see in these pictures. And finally, there's some uh, really, uh, there's quite a lot actually, a lot of local art galleries around Hong Kong. So despite all the concerns about censorship there, um, the art market, especially the private art market where you can go to a local gallery and purchase work, um, it's actually very, it's, it's booming. Um, and I think that has to do with as well the fact that there's such a high concentration of wealth in Hong Kong, of um, a high concentration of billionaires and millionaires who are interested in purchasing art, not necessarily political art, but more just, you know, generally aesthetically pleasing type of art. Um, yeah, so I guess like, let me see. So um, this is kind of my conclusion. Um, it's just to sort of think about um, uh, how Hong Kong is kind of transitioning. So uh, most of what I, I talked about so far today um, will probably sort of still be there, but there are some subtle differences you might notice if you go visit um, that might, you know, of, of things that were have changed since before the protest movement. Some of it is like physical remnants. So one of the common tactics for blocking roads during the protest movement was to dig up bricks from these old brick sidewalks and put them in the middle of the road. And um, since then, they've just sort of been filled in haphazardly with concrete. And so all around the city, you will see this type of pattern where it's brick sidewalks with like patches of uh, haphazardly placed concrete. There's also um, a uh, kind of like um, fortification of a lot of public spaces due to um, them being targets of protests in, in the past. For example, at the airport, there was a major rally uh, one weekend. And ever since that rally, you can't enter the airport without going through these huge metal barricades and presenting your boarding pass, presenting your passport. Um, so that's another you know, feeling of, that, of change that you might experience if you visit. 
The rest of it maybe is not as visible on, on the ground, um, but um, sort of if you read the news or you're on social media, you can and read the headlines, you can really feel how Hong Kong society and culture, especially the political culture, um, is changing. So these are just a couple of the headlines of within the past year. Um, some of the topics include like the um, shutting down of, um, of different organizations, of, of media organizations, or civil society groups, the imposition of a national security curriculum in local schools, um, the rise of emigration and people's desire to emigrate from the city. Uh, there was a recent survey, I guess, that said around 40% of Hong Kong, like current Hong Kongers would like to emigrate, which is you know, a huge, huge number. Uh, obviously, they probably can't all don't have the means to do that, but it's um, definitely, uh, you know, uh, colors the cultural, um, the sense of identity and belonging in the city. Um, there's that, as I mentioned, there's sort of a heightened security presence. So um, there's an interesting article here in the Financial Times about how, um, you know, the crime rate in Hong Kong is actually very low. There is very low crime. It's very, very safe. Um, and yet the police budget and the amount of officers that are there is, is sort of hugely disproportionate to the amount of crime that actually takes place. And so there is this sort of heightened sense of security, uh, increase in security budgets since the protests. Um, all of that uh, is, is kind of um, evident. Um, there's um, new plans to continue building infrastructure that connects Hong Kong to mainland China through new um, border checkpoints and as well as a new kind of northern, uh, they said northern metropolis, so future housing development they want to put right next to Shenzhen as a sort of way to perhaps integrate the two cities economically and, and culturally. Um, and uh, finally, um, the COVID-19 situation, um, uh, you know, pretty much it seems like the rest of the world, except for China, is opening up and starting to not care so much about the COVID statistics, uh, especially with, uh, you know, uh, with vaccines sort of uh, becoming more widespread. Um, however, Hong Kong is still, uh, if you want to visit, you still, it's a 21 day quarantine um, to visit Hong Kong, which is sort of excessive and scientifically perhaps not very justifiable, but um, they're doing it in a way to, um, because they're prioritizing opening the border with mainland China before opening um, international borders. And so um, that just sort of brings me full circle that reconsider, um, you know, maybe this label of Asia's world city, uh, you know, to what extent does that still hold true today? I mean, you can still find so much internationalism, multiculturalism within Hong Kong, uh, whether it's the food or the people or the open, you know, uh, open ideologies. Um, however, in practice, especially with COVID and, and the arrangement of um, uh, priorities in terms of uh, COVID policy and, and as well as development, um, the priority has definitely shifted um, to integrating with mainland China more so than the rest of the world. And, um, you know, if that means closing international borders in order to open Chinese borders, um, you know, it seems the government is uh, perfectly willing um, to make that trade off. Um, and so I don't, you know, I don't have an answer for this, nor do I have like a, a judgment of whether it's right or wrong or if one way is better than the other. I mean, uh, simple math will sort of dictate that. It seems that Hong Kong is, you know, it, it's more prudent to integrate with this hugely, um, you know, this huge economic potential in the greater Bay Area. Um, however, um, if that goes against the desires and wishes of the residents, you know, to what extent is that actually uh, ethical or, or desirable? So um, a lot of big questions to sort of end on uh, that I don't really have answers to, but um, all, all things that I've been thinking about, um, both when I, was, uh, when I was living there as well as ever since. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully, you know, if you'd like to discuss these some more, we can do, do some of that in the Q&A. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm so sorry I went over time a bit, but uh, yeah, I guess it was just quite a lot to talk about, so. <laughs> no worries at all, Chris. That was brilliant. One of my favorite presentations. Thank you very much. Um, we do have uh, a few questions from our audience and I wanna encourage people, if you still have questions, go ahead and put those in the Q&A section. Um, but for right now, um, our first question is, do you know what year uh, the octopus cards started being used? I was there a bit before COVID, but do not recall needing them. 
Uh, I think, I don't know the exact year. I think they were like in the 2000s though. Um, and so even early on before, like even in the in the States, before we had our contactless cards, they were adopting these, I think in the in the early 2000s. Um, I don't, it's not, it's definitely not necessary. You can pay with cash or you can buy, I think a paper ticket or one-time use tickets um, if, you're, if you're taking the transport, but um, it is definitely handy uh, if, if you want to use it because it's accepted in so many places. Absolutely. Um, and would you mind unsharing your screen? Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, our next question is, uh, were border crossings and checkpoints time consuming? Oh, this is, uh, yeah, great question. Um, they were actually not, and I think this is uh, sort of shows to how efficient and seamless they're trying to make the system. Um, it's uh, if um, both, so Hong Kong and Chinese residents are automatically eligible, I think, for this E, it's called an E channel. So you don't even have to talk to a border guard. You just sort of place your um, passport or your ID card on a scanner. Um, it scans your face to make sure it matches. And then if it does, you can just go straight through directly. Um, and actually one of the coolest border crossings is, uh, kind of um, in the middle, like the uh, central area of, of Hong Kong and Shenzhen, there's like a couple border crossings where the metro line of Hong Kong will end. Uh, and literally the exit of the metro is just like the border station. You go across and then you're in Shenzhen and then you can get on the Shenzhen metro uh, once again. So it's really like integrated and seamless. Um, I think for if you're visiting for the first time, you will still need to go see the, the border guard. But otherwise, um, you know, it takes probably like 10 minutes or 15 minutes to get through all of it. Right. Um, is there any food produced uh, in Hong Kong or is it primarily imported? Um, I, I think it's mostly imported. Um, there are some farms in the new territories, but it's mostly like small scale, like family type of farms. Um, and I, I didn't see many like, you know, I don't think animals are great. Like there wasn't much livestock or, or anything like that. So um, it's mostly like small scale farms and the rest of it, I think, is uh, imported. Great. Um, did you feel safe while you were there? Uh, yeah, like great question. Um, so uh, I think the times that were most kind of dubiously uh, like, you know, in terms of safety were definitely those intense moments. Um, if, if you're near a rally or um, a police sort of action, um, those would, would be kind of the, um, like the most, I guess, I don't want to say frightening, but like you just have to be kind of smart and, and um, not do anything rash because you can get kind of like emotional in those uh, moments. Um, I think like, uh, you know, there would be plenty of warnings given and, and, you know, they would give directions of like where you should, should go to. But, um, you know, sort of being like just someone who's kind of interested in kind of social movements and sort of the interaction between like, um, you know, protests and police and that sort of thing. Um, I, I did, I sort of, I stood at a distance, but I did want to sort of see what, what happened. Um, <clears throat> in terms of just general safety though, like it, it's a very, very safe place. I never felt like unsafe in terms of like, you know, petty crime or, uh, you know, theft or anything like that. Um, yeah, if you're, um, you know, if you're going and just as a tourist or whatever, it should be very, very safe. Absolutely. Um, does the high density uh, of the population cause any social distress, anxiety, or mental health issues, or has the uh, population adapted to it? Um, I uh, so I think the population is definitely used to living around such other people, uh, so many other people. But um, I will say that I do think it can cause that that kind of um, stress or anxiety, um, especially because uh, and I didn't talk about this too much, but there are a lot of other sort of social challenges um, facing Hong Kong. So despite the fact that it's very developed, um, it has a very high level of wealth inequality. Um, there's a lot of people who struggle to find housing. A lot of people don't see kind of future opportunity um, as, as being very feasible. So I think that can also contribute to a lot of the social anxiety and um, maybe mental health challenges. So it is, uh, I think maybe we see similar things in, in our country too, but um, that is definitely a problem, uh, like mental health and anxiety, that sort of thing. Absolutely. Um, there was a beach you showed in the presentation. Uh, somebody asks, can you swim at that beach? Oh yeah, uh, so I think, uh, so most of them you can. Uh, there are a couple which are kind of located near like power plants or industrial areas that you have to be more careful of. But I think in general, um, all the beaches that are, you know, the popular ones, you can swim there. There'll be like a swimming area, usually like with uh, buoys that designate um, where it's good to swim. 
Um, a few more questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, is the middle class much larger than the lower class in uh, Hong Kong? Hmm. Uh, good. Uh, good question. I don't. I don't know the statistics. My sense is um, that it. You know, Hong Kong kind of suffers from a similar uh, challenge that we have here, where the middle class is sort of being slowly hollowed out um, due to the sort of dramatic wealth inequalities um, in in the society. And um, one of the challenges is there's not as many social welfare programs in Hong Kong. For example, I don't think there's like a social security, uh, like a government provided social security benefit program. So a lot of people have to use personal savings for um, retirement, um, which, um, you know, like maybe maybe during the like 1990s and 2000s, that was feasible. But nowadays, uh, with um, like lower paying jobs uh, for, for more people, um, it's it be, it's becoming more challenging. So um, I would say like in terms of raw numbers, probably the middle class is still bigger than the lower class or the upper class. But um, that is sort of a, a shifting as well. Yeah. Um, two more questions here. Uh, do you happen to know, um, in terms of uh, tourism, what uh, countries or people from certain countries make up the uh, majority of um, tourists to Hong Kong? Yeah, so um, also I don't know the exact statistics, but um, my general knowledge is that, um, at least this is all pre-COVID, pre-border closures, um, the vast majority were from mainland China. And uh, that um, is another sort of reason, I guess, why the Chinese, or why the Hong Kong government is shifting its priority to um, closely, integrating closely with mainland China. Um, you know, that's just another example of that. Um, besides mainland Chinese, I think most of the other tourists were from uh, other parts of Asia, East Asia, um, or um, uh, like, you know, the US or Western Europe. Mm, that's my that's my sense at least. I don't know the exact numbers though, so don't quote <laughs> don't quote me on it. <clears throat> um, is there a notable difference um, in the standard of living between Hong Kong and China? Uh, I would say uh, there was definitely before. Um, like the like, let's say 1990s, 2000s, there would have definitely been a major difference that you would notice uh, between, let's say, for example, Shenzhen and Hong Kong. Um, nowadays, uh, that difference is uh, becoming much, much smaller due to the rapid economic growth of major Chinese cities. And in fact, if you go to Shenzhen or Hong Kong, you would you would think that they're pretty much on the same level of, of uh, development in the cities. Um, and so that's actually one thing I would talk to some Hong Kong friends who visited uh, Shenzhen when they were kids, maybe like eight or 10 years old. Um, and they remember it being this kind of like old industrial city, a lot of like poor housing and, um, uh, you know, uh, like just, yeah, kind of impoverished. Um, and now, you know, it's, it's completely unrecognizable uh, in such a short amount of time. Um, and so, yeah, so I would say that has definitely been a, been a shift where um, nowadays major mainland Chinese cities are around the same level of development as Hong Kong. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We, that was our last question, but there were multiple comments saying thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. So thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. That will conclude our travelogue for today. Uh, thank you all so much for attending and for supporting the work of the Geographic Society of Chicago.